has 25% tariff on 16 billion US dollars worth of Chinese imports are uh, to start in two weeks' time. What will be the immediate fallout on both sides? And after China and ASEAN countries reach agreement on negotiating a code of conduct in the South China Sea, how will this affect security in the region? Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. U.S. President Trump's administration has said it is to go ahead with its 25% proposed tariffs on 16 billion U.S. dollars worth of Chinese imports starting on August the 23rd. Now, this is the second batch of the first round of tariffs targeting a total of 50 billion. Meanwhile, China's July exports rose 12.2% year-on-year, up an extra 1% from June. But a weaker yuan, which marked its worst four-month fall on record between April and July could well take the sting out of the new tariffs. Speaking to reporters outside the White House last Friday, Director of the National Economic Council Larry Kudlow mocked Beijing, saying that while the American economy is doing great, China's is in trouble. As its economy is lousy, investors are walking out and the currency is falling. And the White House trade advisor Peter Navarro's belief that the tariffs impact will amount merely to what he called a rounding error has drawn ire from American farmers and corporates who are already suffering from the administration's actions. So how is China likely to, to react? What would be the implications for both economies? Joining me here in Beijing is Professor Tu Xing Quan from the University of International Business and Economics, and from Shanghai, Dr. Dan Steinbach, founder of the Difference Group. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Um, Dr. Steinbach, let me go to you first. Um, first of all, the, the tariff list that's just been announced a couple of hours ago hit a list of 279 liner products, including semiconductors. However, many of these uh, semiconductors uh, uh, originate in the United States, South Korea, and the region of Taiwan. So, do you understand the economic sense behind such tariffs? I think that they are misguided, and I think that they are severely misguided. The reason being that uh, we live in the 21st century when trade has to do with the exports, imports, investment, finance, and so on and so forth. Uh, technology. Uh, but even though they are misguided, they will have a uh, tangible impact over time. I think that we are now in the very early stages of this trade war. I've been concerned myself that it was, has been coming for about 10, 15 years, and more so the past half a decade. Uh, I think that uh, it's a very uh, detrimental way to try to respond to pressures that could be resolved in a very different way. Um, Professor Tu, again, let's continue to look at the details of the announcement from the U.S. Trade uh, Representative's Office. It says that the list also includes electronics, plastics, chemicals, and railway equipment that uh, the office says benefits from Chinese government initiatives to subsidize uh, these, uh, these industries to make China competitive in high-tech industries. Uh, is it really going to work? Well, um, the U.S. government has accused a lot of things uh, about uh, China's industrial policy. Uh, one of them is so-called this, this uh, industrial subsidies. But actually, uh, China has been following the WTO rules on subsidies. Uh, and uh, in the WTO, the U.S. also has uh, filed some cases against the Chinese uh, subsidies. And China has uh, changed its policies. So it is illegal to uh, impose additional tariffs on these uh, electronics and uh, other products in the name of uh, countervailing or uh, anti-subsidies. Uh, 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 yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. Um, so, and uh, again, uh, all these products are made by, as you said, by a lot of uh, foreign companies in China. Uh, I think I don't think that uh, the Chinese government is trying to subsidize these foreign companies to help our exports. Well, um, what the trade representative of the Trump administration uh, or the Trump administration is trying to do is to put pressure on China, according to their own words, to negotiate trade concessions after imposing 34 billion last month. And uh, uh, Dr. Steinbach, what do you think the uh, 16 billion is going to achieve? Uh, what 34 billion?
rebellion has not. <laughs> I think that uh, we are, as I mentioned, in the very early stages of this trade war, and right now we're talking about the tariffs against goods. Now, if we uh, assume that 50 billion will be the final stake, which most likely won't, will not be the case, uh, then some estimates uh, would uh, uh, argue that the impact on China would be about 0.1 percent, uh, penalized Chinese growth by 0.1 percent, U.S. growth by 0.2. Now, let's assume that this would be up to 200 billion, which is something that President Trump has already threatened then you would have to simply quadruple that figure. Now, if you still up that to 500, we would have to have a tenfold figure. This will have an impact, but more in the medium to long term. We will see some impact in terms of uh, exports, imports within the next few months. We have already seen signals of it. We are seeing the impact of it in the global growth prospects. Uh, I think this is a calm before the storm, unless there is a reconciliation that would allow President Trump to save his face. Well, where is the ball uh, at this moment, uh, Professor Tu? Uh, is it in China's court? Is it in the United States court? I mean, uh, first of all, how is China going to retaliate? Do we know it already? Uh, is there any surprise? Um, yeah, this trade war is, of course, launched by the U.S. government uh, in the name of uh, uh, China's so-called uh, infringe of infringement of uh, U.S. IP uh, intellectual property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, uh, since the U.S. has has done such a anti-WTO uh, trade policy, we have to retaliate to defend our uh, national interest. Uh, so now the uh, the Chinese government actually has announced uh, that we will also impose additional tariffs on. Uh, 16 billion uh, U.S. products, but that's of course not good for both sides. How much is that going to hurt the Chinese econo economy? Do we know, or has the market already absorbed in anticipation of what is going to come? Um, uh, as uh, Professor Steinbock said, uh, this trade war has just uh, started. Uh, the market has uh, kind of needed some time to uh, make adjustment to this uh, trade policy change. So I think we have to wait a while to see uh, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to uh, both economies. Okay. Well, let's let's take a look at uh, the renminbi, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, the falling yuan. Um, Dr. Steinbock, how do you read the interpretation of Larry Kudlow, who says that uh, the renminbi is uh, is falling, which means that the Chinese economy is in trouble, investors are fleeing. Uh, can you really? calculate things like that? Well, I think that uh, Larry Kudlow is a wonderful conversationalist and I've always enjoyed his programs on the CNBC. Having said that, he was a supply sider in 1980s and the, the thinking was then that the more you cut taxes, the better it will be for the U.S. economy. In fact, what the U.S. economy generated was a massive tune deficit. Uh, 2007, he published a book on how the Bush boom years will last for uh, quite a more, few years longer, what we got was the 2008 crisis. So he has not always been very good in short-term or even long-term predictions. When it comes to Yuan, I think that we have three or four forces behind the recent fall. One is the concern in China about the bond defaults. Another is, was the lack of liquidity, particularly two or three months ago. And uh, uh, thirdly, there's the uncertainty about the fate of trade, of course, in the, in the longer run. But I would argue that uh, what we've seen is some stabilization. First of all, the Bank of China has been relatively active. It has injected more liquidity in. It has also made it more expensive to short, uh, to short Chinese economy. Uh, the bond defaults, to some degree, they will happen, more of them. But I'm not quite sure that the market has been entirely accurate in its uh, anticipations. I think the reaction may have been a little bit exaggerated. And naturally, there will be uncertainty with this kind of a trade situation. So I see, think that the Chinese central bank has been able to halt the fall of the yuan for now. And, uh, um, but we are more likely to see some uh, depreciation over time, especially the longer this trade conflict will continue. Professor Tu, what does the Chinese side, how does the Chinese side explain the fall of the yuan? Uh, at the same time, some people are saying the fall of the yuan is offsetting some of the negative impacts of the trade tariffs. So is it, is it the good news or bad news for China? 
And the falling of this uh, time, the, uh, the current uh, the RMB is not a kind of policy response to the uh, trade war, but it will uh, really uh, affect the uh, result of the trade war. Uh, I think uh, this is largely because of uh, uh, the appreciation of the U.S. dollar, uh, because the U.S. Uh, government is uh, changing its uh, monetary policy uh, to attract uh, more uh, U.S. dollars back to the United States. Uh, so it will cause uh, depreciation of other currencies. So it does not uh, only happen to uh, RMB. Let's talk also a little bit about uh, what's going to happen next. I mean, we've heard the Trump administration uh, talking about a 200 billion U.S. dollar list and then eventually the possibility of imposing higher tariffs on the entirety of Chinese imports to the United States. Uh, Dr. Steinbach, you were talking about the longer-term implications of such policies. Are we really going to go all the way to that unfortunate eventuality or something or some people will eventually uh, turn things around and make this administration see what is what they're really doing for instance uh, you know in the latest uh, public hearing uh, over 95 percent of people who attended the public hearing voiced their opposition to trade war and corporates such as Toyota or some TV makers here and there and farmers live, uh, have all voiced their frustration or opposition to the policy what's going to take for the Trump administration to turn around A lot of countervailing forces. Uh, this is very true. There are strong forces now against the tariffs within the U.S. First of all, farmers are against them. The largest uh, trade association of U.S. farmers uh, would, uh, is not against subsidies, but uh, when they're being subsidized for the collateral damage uh, as a result of the trade war. But they would rather earn that money on their own. Mm -hmm. And the question is, will you really try to subsidize every group that is being harmed by this trade war in, in the right. U.S.? Secondly, and even more importantly, I think that the, what you, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has done, the launching the campaign against tariffs in early July had to be very important. Okay, well, they were also, in the beginning, uh, the ones that were um, pushing for this administration to do something about their treatment here in China. So they're actually in a kind of dilemma. Anyway, let's talk a little bit also about the determination, the so-called determination of the Trump administration that is not to be underestimated, according to Larry Kudlow. Uh, Professor Tu, what is the position of the Chinese side at this moment? Are they showing any intention to, to succumb to such pressure, to come to the negotiation table as the Trump administration uh, might wish? Yeah, I think the U.S. side should also uh, not underestimate the determination of the Chinese government. Uh, I think this trade war is launched by the U.S. government, and we are defending ourselves. Uh, we are self-defense. So I think we are on the right side. Then we will not surrender uh, to the U.S. pressure, this U.S. coercion. Is there, is there any possibility that the Chinese side would agree to any negotiation under the current circumstances while the tariffs are being slapped? I think the negotiation will start uh, if the U.S. government will uh, stop this kind of trade war. Okay, let's uh, wait and see, and let's leave it here for, for today. Many thanks to my two guests from Shanghai, Dr. Dan Steinbach, founder of the Difference Group, and here in Beijing, Professor Tu Xingquan from the University of International Business and Economics. You have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a short break, and uh, when I come back, I'll be hearing how China and ASEAN countries have come to an agreement over the text for negotiation concerning how to behave themselves in the South China Sea, paving the way for future resolution of maritime disputes. Stay with me. China and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, worked out last Thursday a single text for negotiations on a code of conduct known as COC in the South China Sea. Hailed as a milestone by both sides, the text will be the basis for future negotiations for behavior in the disputed waters. China's State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi welcomed the progress, calling it good news and a major development. He says, we believe that without any disturbances from outside, CLC negotiations will accelerate, referring to U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's statement that concerns of, a thir of third party must be incorporated into the negotiation. Well, he also said the U.S. had been sending massive strategic weaponry into the South China Sea and the region as a show of military might that puts pressure on China and other regional countries. That had become 
and quote unquote, the biggest force behind mil militarization in the region, he said. So when China and ASEAN countries are improving their relations, why is the U.S. keeping up its military presence in the region? Joining me here in the Beijing studio is uh, Luo Yongkun, Associate Professor at the China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. I'm from New York, Professor Dennis Wilder, Special Assistant to former U.S. President George W. Bush. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Uh, Professor Luo, explain to us, first of all, the significance of what was agreed last Thursday, the single text or single draft for negotiations between China and ASEAN over the code of conduct in the South China Sea. What does it mean? It is very significant for China and ASEAN to reach consensus on the single text. Why? It shows that China and ASEAN countries are able to manage the South China Sea issue. Before or in the past years, we will see that the Western countries always hype up the South China Sea issue. It seems that the South China Sea issue has become a problem that cannot be overcome by China and ASEAN countries. But the fact shows that China and ASEAN countries, we can reach consensus not only this year but also from the year of 2002. We discussed from DOC to COC. So it shows that China and ASEAN countries are able to manage the issue. This is the first. The second is it shows that China and ASEAN countries, the relations are very stable. The relations are not challenged anymore by the South China Sea issue. Even though the, cons the country's concerns about South China Sea issue, all the Western countries are always to hype up the issue. But our relations are stable, not only in South China Sea, but also in economy. Okay. Well, uh, in there is the third parties uh, that we are talking about, and everybody knows what we are talking about. In a draft text, uh, Beijing suggested that uh, uh, excluding non-regional countries, including the U.S., from proposed joint military exercises and uh, energy exploration with Southeast Asian nations in the South China Sea. Uh, the Philippines government, which assumed the role of ASEAN-China country coordinator this August, finds, quote-unquote, nothing objectionable in China's suggestion to exclude outside countries. And uh, Filipino presidential spokesperson Harry Roker said last week that, of course, the United States is 10,000 miles away, so if the intention is to build stronger relations between military forces who are neighbors, then the U.S. will really be out of place. However, uh, Professor Wilder, let me come to you. However, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo insisted that concerns of third parties should be incorporated into the Code of Conduct. So what could be the U.S. role and uh, relevance there? Why does the U.S. insist on being part of it? Well, first of all, this is a working draft. It is a living draft, and it's one that many countries are going to take a look at and make comments upon. In terms of the South China Sea, I think we have to remember that a huge amount of international trade flows through the South China Sea in international waters. So the South China Sea is not an exclusive zone of China or the other nations that are involved. Uh, third parties have an interest here, a very strong interest, one of the strongest interests, I would argue, uh, in the world because of the amount of trade that billions and billions of dollars a year is going through that area. So it's not just the United States, it's Japan, Australia, uh, people who don't have claims in the South China Sea in the region. There are many different players who are interested in the code of conduct and will comment on it. Well, um, I think um, Professor Wilder makes a good point there. Uh, Professor Luo, what is China's or what is ASEAN's consideration that they believe uh, they, they, sh they don't need to incorporate any third parties into this code of conduct? What is their consideration? I, I think the answer is very simple. That's because the South China Sea issue or the issue of COC is just the issue between China and ASEAN countries. If the United States wants to involve in the issue, we can ask the question, does Japan be involved in the issue, or the Japan, India, Australia. So it is very complicated if other countries involved in the issue. I think China and ASEAN countries will face more and more challenges and difficulties when we talk about the South China Sea dispute. As everybody knows, South China Sea dispute is just a dispute between China and some ASEAN countries rather than the outsiders. But how do you address the point I think Professor Wilder was talking about, the possible disturbance of uh, commercial navigation uh, of you know, ships from other countries that could be passing this water um, if 
that shouldn't that be taken into consideration when China and ASEAN are negotiating their code of conduct in this area, Professor Luo? Uh, in fact, when we talk about the freedom of navigation, China and ASEAN countries, we have the consensus that is freedom of navigation in South China is never a problem. When we talk about this issue, if we ask them in detail, which country prevents the freedom of navigation, nobody can cite an example because it is never an issue in South China Sea. So I think if we want to talk about freedom of navigation, we should talk about how do we cooperate to further maintain the peace and stability, to prove for words the freedom of navigation, rather than which country to prevent, to stop the freedom of navigation. Professor, Vi Professor Wilder, you would like to address that? Sure. I think the reason that this is of concern is, as we all know, there has been a military buildup in the South China Sea. China is the biggest player in that military buildup, putting surface to air missiles and, uh, and anti-ship missiles on uh, the newly created islands. Uh, but the Vietnamese and others are already also militarizing. So the international community has to be worried about whether or not this kind of military buildup will lead to attempts to, at some point, block international trade and commerce through the area. You know, you mean the United States uh, might be worried that this kind of uh, buildup could be used, right, Professor Wallace? I, I think that's right. <laughs> okay. uh, yes, third parties, as okay. we say. <laughs> Professor, yeah, Professor Luo, what is your answer here? Uh, by the way, what China is really doing in the South China, in the in these islands in the South China Sea? Yes, if we look at what China has done in the past years, if my memory is good, I remember that China and ASEAN countries, we have reached consensus on the cues. That is the code of unplanned encounters at sea in South China Sea. And we also established the hot lines of communication between foreign ministry, between China and ASEAN countries. That means that China and ASEAN countries, we have done a lot to push forward our cooperation, even the meal-to-meal -meal cooperation. For example, this year we have proposed China and ASEAN to joint, have the joint military exercise in the region. As we know that it is the first time that ASEAN as an organization to cooperate with a single big countries like China in this region. So in my opinion, militarization in the South China Sea does not, it's not a problem. It's not a problem, but when it is a problem, it is hyped up by the Western countries. Why? If we look at the U.S. aircraft carrier and warship came into the South China Sea, not for one time, but frequently, it leads to the risk of the conflict in the South China Sea. Like the Prime Minister of Mahadir said, that the Malaysian minister said, Prime Minister said, I'm worried about the warships and what aircraft carrier in South China Sea and in Malacca Street. I think this is ASEAN concerns. ASEAN wants peace and stability in the region. Well, I think the United States would argue probably that because of uh, China's uh, hyped uh, action, land reclamation and uh, bringing weapons, uh, advanced weaponry to these islands, that the United States feel uh, pressured, feel obliged to increase its military presence to counter that kind of uh, stepping up of, uh, of infrastructure military infrastructure. How would you counter that? Uh, in fact, I think what China has done in the South China Sea is we just a reaction to the United States. If you look at China's land reclamation or other activities, we are not targeting at any other countries. We are not targeting at ASEAN countries. We are not targeting at the, China, uh, the United States. So what I want to say is China has done a lot. So we just want to prevent the outsiders to blur, to, stop up, to stir up the tension in the South China Sea. So we want to cooperate with all the countries, including China and ASEAN countries, to maintain peace and stability in the region. Uh, on the other hand, while China and uh, ASEAN are uh, warming up their relations, uh, entering a new cycle of, uh, of uh, uh, good relations between the two sides, the United States seem not to be so happy with such news. Um, would you agree with that uh, kind of judgment? I don't agree with so. 
Why? Because the stronger ties between China and ASEAN, first of all, is very good news for the regional peace and the prosperity. And the region is open for United States. So United States can play a very constructive role in the region to push forward the prosperity and the security, rather than to use its mindset of the Cold War to fight against China and ASEAN countries. I think that in this region, China and ASEAN cooperation is not a zero-sum game. So if United States wants to play a geopolitical game in the region, I think it is not only a bad news, but it is very dangerous. Um, at the same time, um, the Philippines reframed from um, standoff with China over maritime disputes, and now it seems that the United States is ramping up a military support to Vietnam. And I would like to ask this question to Professor Wilder, who is now joining us on the line. Uh, last month, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said uh, the U.S. and Vietnam would join hands to uphold freedom of navigation and overflights in the South China Sea. Uh, Pompeo also unveiled nearly 300 million. Uh, U.S. dollars in new security funding for the so-called Indo-Pacific region, and before that, 130 million U.S. dollars in infrastructure fund for Asia-Pacific economies as part of the White House's so-called Indo-Pacific blueprint. So, Professor Wilder, what is the United States strategy in this region for the moment? I think one of the things that your listeners need to understand is that the United States has been a Pacific power um, for centuries. Uh, we have a border, a long border with the Pacific, and we have done trade with the Pacific ever since the founding of the nation. So our interest in this region is very real. We are the largest investor in Southeast Asia, and thus we have an interest in maintaining the peace, in helping these countries to defend themselves. And uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific region strategy of the president is very consistent with that. We're not trying to start a war. We're not trying to uh, create problems. But neither do we want to see small countries coerced by their large neighbors. Okay. Um, Professor Law, very briefly, is that what's going to happen? Uh, yes, I think we agree that U.S. is a Pacific power, but the question is, U.S. cannot exclude China in the region, and China cannot exclude U.S. in this region. So the, the answer is China and U.S. should, we worked for the win-win solution. That's the answer for China and the U.S. in this region. Okay, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to Dennis Wilder, special assistant to former U.S. President George W. Bush, and Luo Yongkun from China Institute of Contemporary International Relations. And that's it for this edition of The Point. As always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point. With our likes, download the application called CGTN to watch the show on your mobile device devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.